Clinical Correlate Ectopic Pregnancy You're familiar with the components of the female reproductive system. Now we'll take a closer look at some pathologies that can arise within this system. A fallopian tube's function is essential in the development of a normal pregnancy. Pathologic and structural changes to the tubes can lead to an ectopic pregnancy. Take a moment to read the following clinical vignette. This female of reproductive age presents to the emergency department with abdominal pain that began two days ago. The pain has worsened over the past several hours and is accompanied by vaginal spotting. She has become weak and lightheaded. Her gynecologic history is significant for two episodes of pelvic inflammatory disease or PID. Although her menstrual cycle is regular, her last period was seven weeks ago. She denies dysuria, hematuria, or history of nephrolithiasis. The patient is in obvious pain as evidenced by her fetal position. She's febrile, tachycardic, and hypotensive. Abdominal exam reveals tenderness and guarding. Speculum exam reveals small amount of blood at the cervical os. No vaginal discharge was noted. By manual pelvic exam is positive for cervical motion tenderness. Urinary beta HCG is positive. This patient's left lower abdominal pain, which is associated with amenorrhea, signs of hypovolemia, peritoneal irritation, vaginal bleeding, cervical motion tenderness, and positive beta HCG suggests a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. What's the most common site of implantation in ectopic pregnancy? This clinical correlate has five learning objectives. By the end, you should be able to 1. Discuss the differential diagnosis of acute lower abdominal pain. 2. Define ectopic pregnancy and its risk factors. 3. Describe the anatomy of the female reproductive system and the first week of gestation. 4. Identify the clinical manifestations and diagnostic tests in ectopic pregnancy. 5. Review the treatment and complications of ectopic pregnancy. We'll begin with our first learning objective and discuss the differential diagnosis of acute lower abdominal pain. Common causes of lower abdominal pain are urinary tract infections, nephrolithiasis, pelvic inflammatory disease, diverticular disease, appendicitis, ovarian torsion, and ectopic pregnancy. Most of these conditions can present with symptoms of either to the right or left side of the lower abdomen. Urinary tract infections usually present acutely, but would be less dramatic than in this patient. Furthermore, urinary tract infections would most likely present with dysuria, increase in frequency, or change in color or smell of urine, none of which are reported in this case. This makes urinary tract infection in this patient unlikely. Nephrolithiasis is more common in males and presents with hematuria and colically flank pain that radiates to the groin. However, these symptoms are not found in this patient. Lower abdominal pain can also be caused by pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID, which is inflammation of the uterus, fallopian tubes, and or ovaries. The clinical presentation ranges from subclinical to severe, with signs and symptoms including fever, lower abdominal pain, cervical motion tenderness, and mucopurulent discharge. The most common causes of PID are chlamydia, trachomitis, and Neisseria gonorrhea. This patient has a history of two episodes of PID. However, 
Her current presentation includes amenorrhea and vaginal bleeding without discharge. Also, her beta-HCG test is positive. This presentation points to the diagnosis of ectopic pregnancy rather than an episode of PID. Diverticulitis would classically present in older patients. In addition to abdominal pain and fever, it causes other gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, and change in bowel habits. The pain in acute appendicitis usually begins in the periumbilical area and then shifts to the right lower quadrant. It's usually associated with nausea, vomiting, anorexia, and fever. Pain located in the right lower quadrant is highly suggestive of acute appendicitis. Another cause of lower abdominal pain is ovarian torsion. Ovarian torsion refers to the rotation of the ovary over its own axis, which leads to occlusion of the ovarian artery and or vein, eliciting pain on the affected side. There's usually a history of exercise just prior to the onset of the pain. In ectopic pregnancy, implantation of the embryo occurs outside the uterine cavity. It presents with unilateral pelvic abdominal pain, amenorrhea, and vaginal bleeding. When ruptured, the symptoms will include signs of peritoneal irritation and shock. Let's now move to the second learning objective and define ectopic pregnancy and its risk factors. Ectopic pregnancy is defined as pregnancy outside of the uterine cavity. If the blastocyst, which is the embryologic structure that should implant in the uterus for any reason doesn't reach the endometrium, it can regress, or it could implant in any of the anatomic sites in its pathway. This is the very definition of ectopic pregnancy. It's established that 1 to 2 percent of all pregnancies are ectopic. The most common location for the development of an ectopic pregnancy is the ampulla of the fallopian tube, which occurs in 80 percent of the cases, followed by the fimbriae and the isthmus. Other rare locations of implantation are the cervix, the abdominal cavity, and ovary. Of all these locations, the one with the best probability of nearing term is within the abdomen. Abdominal ectopic pregnancy most commonly occurs in the rectouterine pouch, also called the pouch of Douglas, which is the space formed between the anterior wall of the rectum and the inferior wall of the uterus. The most common predisposing risk factor for ectopic pregnancy is previous pelvic inflammatory disease. The infection itself, as well as the inflammatory reaction in the area, leads to tubal scarring with loss of cilia and narrowing of the lumen. This results in problematic transport of the zygote. In the same fashion, damage to the tubes from previous tubal surgery to resect a tumor or as means of contraception, increases the risk of developing an ectopic pregnancy. History of curatage is another risk factor. Curatage can disrupt the normal anatomy of the uterus and impair normal implantation. The single most important risk factor for developing an ectopic pregnancy is a history of a previous ectopic pregnancy. The recurrence rate is 15% after the first ectopic pregnancy and 30% after the second. Smoking is another risk factor for ectopic pregnancy because it's thought to slow down ciliary motion. Another risk factor for ectopic pregnancy is prenatal exposure to diethylstilbestrol or DES, which is a synthetic estrogen used until 1971 to prevent miscarriage. DES can cause anatomical malformations in female offspring, including T-shaped uterus, in which implantation is impaired. Other risk factors are increased maternal age and the use of intrauterine devices, or IUDs, for contraception, especially those containing progesterone. We'll turn to our third learning objective and review the anatomy of the female reproductive system and the first week of gestation. The female reproductive system is composed of ovaries, 
fallopian tubes, uterus, cervix, vagina, external genitalia, and mammary glands. The ovaries have two regions, the cortex and medulla. At birth, the cortex contains approximately 400,000 follicles, out of which only about 450 reach maturity in the adult. In every menstrual cycle, a few follicles begin to mature, but usually a single follicle becomes dominant, fully develops, and releases an oocyte upon ovulation. This process is known as follicular maturation. Maturation involves the formation of the primary follicle, secondary follicle, and finally, the graphene follicle. The fallopian tube is divided into the infundibulum, ampulla, isthmus, and interstitial segment, which is where the fallopian tube meets the uterus. Fallopian tubes are lined by ciliated mucosa that beats towards the uterus. The uterine wall is composed of three layers, the endometrium, which forms the lining of the uterus, the myometrium, formed by smooth muscle, and the perimetrium, which is the peritoneal layer of the broad ligament. At the same time that the follicles mature, hormonal effects on the endometrium prepare it to potentially receive the product of fertilization. The vagina is lined by stratified squamous epithelium rich in glycogen. The ovaries, fallopian tubes, uterus, and proximal one-third of the vagina are embryologically derived from the mesoderm, with the distal two-thirds of the vagina being derived from the ectoderm. Gestation begins with fertilization. This takes place in the ampulla of the fallopian tube, when a spermatozoid meets with the secondary oocyte arrested in metaphase of meiosis II, forming a zygote. After fertilization, the zygote undergoes rapid successive mitotic divisions or cleavage in the oviduct to form a blastula consisting of increasingly smaller blastomeres. At the 32 cell stage, it's called the morula. A blastocyst forms as fluid develops within the morula. The blastocyst contains an inner cell mass known as the embryoblast, which will later become the embryo and an outer cell mass known as the trophoblast, which becomes the placenta. The trophoblast differentiates into cytotrophoblasts and syncytiotrophoblasts. Implantation of the blastocyst usually occurs within 6 to 12 days after fertilization, typically in the distal one-third of the uterus. This process would result in a normal intrauterine pregnancy. However, if these events don't take place normally, an ectopic pregnancy can occur. Now let's turn to the fourth learning objective and identify the clinical manifestations and diagnostic tests in ectopic pregnancy. Clinically, ectopic pregnancy classically presents with amenorrhea, abdominal discomfort or pain, and vaginal bleeding. Amenorrhea is the first sign noticed. The most common cause of amenorrhea in women of fertile age is pregnancy. However, this may be difficult to evaluate in women with irregular cycles. During the abdominal exam, an enlarged and painful uterus may be noted, although 50% of women have no pain until the fallopian tube ruptures. When this happens, patients may experience severe pain with signs of peritoneal irritation. Pelvic exam in these patients may reveal cervical motion tenderness brought upon by palpation of the cervix and lateralization by the examiner. Cervical motion tenderness is indicative of PID or ectopic pregnancy. It's important to clarify that it's not the cervix that's tender, rather one or both of the fallopian tubes. When the examiner moves the cervix, the fallopian tubes are pulled and movement of the inflamed area results in pain. When ectopic pregnancy ruptures, bleeding can manifest in two ways. Internal bleeding may pool in the abdominal and or pelvic cavities. External bleeding occurs vaginally 
and is due to a drop in progesterone levels. If the amount of bleeding is significant, it can lead to hypovolemia and shock. It's important to have a high degree of suspicion of ectopic pregnancy in any patient of reproductive age presenting with abdominal pain. If the clinical presentation suggests ectopic pregnancy, urinary beta-HCG is the first test to obtain. This test should always be performed in women of reproductive age who present to the emergency department regardless of the chief complaint. Urinary beta-HCG is a qualitative test that will report the presence or absence of the hormone. If the test is positive, a quantitative serum test should be obtained to measure the specific level of beta-HCG. This will be useful to determine the age of gestation and also to assess treatment efficacy. Ultrasonography should follow. The most specific ultrasound finding for ectopic pregnancy is fetal heart motion outside the uterus. However, in most cases, intrauterine pregnancy is not found. This is why it's important to first obtain a positive beta HCG. Note that a transvaginal ultrasound is more sensitive than a transabdominal one. A seldom used procedure is to aspirate fluid from the pouch of Douglas called caldocentesis. In a sterile setting, a speculum is inserted to visualize the posterior fornix. A needle is inserted through the pouch, entering the peritoneum. If blood is drawn, it would be considered positive. Despite the fact that a positive caldocentesis is not diagnostic of ectopic pregnancy, it can be useful, especially if ultrasound is not readily available. Let's move to the fifth learning objective and outline the treatment and complications of ectopic pregnancy. Ectopic pregnancy is treated as soon as the diagnosis is confirmed in order to minimize the risk of rupture and severe blood loss. Treatment depends on how early the pregnancy is detected and the patient's overall condition. Treatment includes medical and or surgical management. Medical therapy is preferred in unruptured cases with beta HCG levels under 6,000 milli international units per milliliter. In this situation, medical management is effective in the majority of cases. The drug of choice is methotrexate, which will deplete the developing embryo of folic acid, an essential molecule for its growth. The lower the beta HCG levels upon initiation of medical therapy, the higher the efficacy of methotrexate. Previous liver disease precludes the use of methotrexate. After initiating therapy, beta HCG levels must be followed on a weekly basis to ensure its progressive decline. If levels rise, stay unchanged, or if the ectopic pregnancy ruptures, surgical management must be considered. Laparoscopy with salpingostomy, which is the opening of the fallopian tube without its removal, has become the preferred method of surgical treatment. However, a salpingectomy or a tubal removal must be performed in the case of rupture. Rupture of ectopic pregnancy can lead to hypovolemic shock, disseminated intravascular coagulation, and even death. Long-term complications are infertility, and increased risk of recurrence. Let's return to our vignette and apply what we've just discussed. The patient's clinical presentation includes most of the signs and symptoms of an ectopic pregnancy. More so, it appears to have ruptured given her signs of shock and peritoneal irritation. The best course of management would be to resuscitate the patient using intravenous fluids and perform an emergency salbingectomy. What's the most common site of implantation in ectopic pregnancy? The ampulla of the fallopian tube is the most common site of implantation in an ectopic pregnancy.